bump to go a little bit. Not that I can bump much higher. Good morning, church family. Welcome if you're joining us in person or online. Please stand and join us as we worship together. I raise a hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies, I raise a hallelujah, louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah, my weapon is a melody. Fight for 
Good morning, church. My name is Sebastian Espillaga. I am the pastor for our Hispanic uh, ministry. This morning, we have Elizabeth uh, Santos, who has been coming to our Spanish service for more than a year now. Elizabeth uh, has felt the call from the Holy Spirit to get baptized for a few months now. And just like we all do, uh, we have things in our life that we want to improve. Uh, and she felt like there were certain things that she wanted to get right, to, you know, before she came in front of the Lord. But so we all have things to improve as we all have opportunities in our life. It's important that we bring those opportunities to the Lord first and that we give him, an, you know, a chance uh, that to help whatever it is that needs uh, healing in our life. So this morning, Elizabeth comes out of faith uh, to give her life to, to Christ. Uh, Ms. Digna. Good morning, everyone. I'm very uh, humble myself to the Lord King Jesus, and I'm thank you to the pastor. Um, to let me please bless this uh, request from my sister Elizabeth. I know she, uh, I know Elizabeth most like eight years ago, and the Lord put me to share with um, with Elizabeth, and I'm gonna do in Spanish, but I'm gonna say in English. It's gonna be a Revelation chapter three. 2021. So, hermana, en el nombre de Jesús, vengo aquí a compartir la palabra que Dios te ha dado en este día. Dice el Señor en Apocalipsis 20. Dice, yo aquí estoy en la puerta y llamo, y si alguno oye mi voz y abre la puerta, entraré y, a él, y, y cenaré con él y él cenará contigo. So, este día, mi hermana, tú has, has dado un, vas a dar un paso muy hermoso y el Señor se rejocija, dice la palabra de Dios. Hermanos míos, dice que él, hay una fiesta en los cielos hoy, que si un hijo, una hija viene, estamos en fiesta. Esta palabra te da, hermana mía, como me dijiste esa noche, no soy yo la que estoy atrás tuyo, sino el Señor que estaba estos ocho años. Yo solamente soy un vaso para el Señor y toda la honra y la gloria es para Él. Yo les invito, hermanos, que si nosotros estamos compartiendo la palabra, no dejemos de orar por ellos, no dejemos, no es tanto de que estamos todos los días con ellos, sino la oración tiene poder. Y yo puedo ver este día y testificar, pueden ver que el Señor en su tiempo ha tocado el corazón de mi hermana y gloria a Dios. Y el 21 dice así, y, y él dice, el que venciera, le daré a aquel que se siente conmigo en mi trono, así como yo he vencido. Su so, hermana mía, este paso que tú vas a dar es un paso más de fe, pero quiero que sepas, no importa lo que venga, porque el Señor está con nosotros. Y estamos en victoria los que hemos decidido seguir a Cristo Jesús. So, esta palabra dice, el que venciera. So, acuérdate, en los momentos duros, el Señor está contigo. Entonces, thank you so much for the privilege that you let me come and speak in here. And a praise to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one is coming today. Recibe al Señor Jesucristo como tu Salvador y Señor. Sí. Por tu profesión de fe, hermana, te bautizo en el nombre del Padre, del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. morning we also have Stephanie Price. Stephanie moved uh, here from Tennessee not too long ago. She has been uh, attending our service uh, visiting us. She's here this morning proud uh, to take Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Yes. Stephanie do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Yes. Do you take him as your Lord and Savior? I do. Yes. Because of your profession of faith my sister I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank 
think of a better way uh, to start our service uh, this morning. Hey guys, uh, thanks again for being here. Uh, let me give you this one quick announcement before we go into our time of communion. Um, these are Catanino bags, and they are out in the lobby, and you can pick up uh, one or two or several uh, today if you would like. These uh, are in partnership with some uh, folks down in Guatemala, in Guatemala City. Uh, Luke Dove is one of our uh, together partners. He's a missionary down there teaching kids. Uh, he's a youth minister, actually, at a, at a um, at a center down there, and um, he teaches Bible lessons and classes to kids um, every day. Uh, and so he's sharing the love of, of, of God with them and the story of Jesus with them. And so what they want to do is during Christmas, uh, a lot of the kids, there's about 200 kids that they work with, another 100 or so in the community. A lot of the kids are, are orphans or have very uh, just horrible situations, uh, home life. And so they try to uh, fill these bags with some toys and goodies at Christmas time to give out to some of the kids uh, in the area and so they ask us to partner with them in that effort so if you could uh, all the instructions and the cards and everything that describes what to do and how to do it are in the bags you can take one of those home this week they need to be back by October the 15th or the 10th we need to get them to Knoxville Tennessee by October the 15th so that they can go on a big uh, shipping container and get to Guatemala uh, so that the kids can have them for Christmas so if you'd be interested in doing that helping us uh, in that way grab one of those bags today Hey, you guys uh, probably have, have recognized on your calendar uh, that today is September the 11th. And if you're of a certain age, some of you guys are younger and weren't even born or have had uh, lessons in school about September the 11th, uh, 2001. But for, for some of us, we remember exactly where we were and we remember the details of, of that morning. You probably remember what you were wearing or where you were, or who you were standing with, the conversations you were having, the emotions that were going through your, your heart and your mind as you watched on TV what was going on in New York and in Pennsylvania and at the Pentagon. And so today, right, 21 years later, we stop to remember a very significant event when our country was attacked by terrorists. And we all knew that the world had changed, that our country had changed, and that war was probably on the horizon. And so it was a significant moment. One of the taglines that, that has kind of gone on since then, right, is never forget. Never forget that significant moment in history. I remember hearing stories that when, growing up, my parents would talk about the day John F. Kennedy was assassinated. I wasn't alive then, but for my parents who were young then, they remember that as a very significant event in their lives. We stop, we pause to remember significant events, don't we? Birthdays, anniversaries, maybe the death of a dearly loved person in your life the most significant event that this world has ever seen is the one that we're going to stop and to remember here now. The death, the, the sacrifice, the cross, and what that represents. The fact that Jesus gave himself for us, for you and for me, for all of humanity, for all time. The most significant event in the history of of the world. Let's remember that. Let's pray about that. God, we thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning to gather in this place, to sing worship songs to you, to sing, uh, to see two new sisters be born again. And the significance of that, the life change that takes place right in front of our eyes. God, you do that. And you do that through your son, Jesus. And so we stop in the next few moments to remember the body that was broken, the blood that was shed of an innocent man, God, the Son of God, Jesus, who stretched out his arms on that cross for us willingly. He wasn't forced. He wasn't made to do that. He did that because of his love for us. God, we can never repay you for that sacrifice, but we can remember it 
because it was the most significant event that this world has ever seen. May we never forget. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
let all agree there's no power like the power of Jesus I will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of Jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like the power of Jesus some church or what man yeah this is like i like this is not on the script there ain't no powerpoint we'll get back to it what just happened has been a, is an answer to decades decades of us praying that god would let us cross every bridge possible in Shelby County and if possible take it outside of the county to the world and and we actually did more world things first but then like like <laughs> Heidi like you're smiling like from ear to ear come on and Vince Elizabeth like for forever but who knew who knew that a kid that played tennis born in Chile was going to move to Shelbyville, Kentucky and become an elder and a pastor in our church. Who knew that? There you go. There you go. Who knew this big dude down here named Oscar was going to end up getting training like in Bible and stuff was going to end up in a church in Shelbyville, Kentucky. Who knew? God did. God did. And so we are so thankful for that. Where's Elizabeth? Where you at? Where you at? Is, is Stabby in? That's like, see, I told you, I knew some. I knew some. All right. All right. So man, and, and, and then Stephanie and just moving out here and getting to know her and her family and like, God's doing stuff. Y'all just get ready. God's doing stuff. Because, and, and I say get ready because the next step, he might take you out of your comfort zone. Uh, there's, if you're a parent, there's a really significant chance he's about to do that in the next 30 minutes. I'm just warning you. I'm just warning you about that. Because we're in this series that we're calling Better, all right? And we're talking about how we can be better at home, not perfect at home. Why don't we want to be perfect at home? Because that doesn't exist, right? Perfect doesn't exist. There are no perfect marriages because there are no perfect people. Since there's no perfect people, no perfect marriage, there's no perfect family. So, but if we all work on getting better, then that's a win. That's a win. That's a win that we're going after and we're working really, really hard at that. And so what have we done? The first week we talked about, yeah, okay, a lot of our homes are broken and messed up. We'd like to have the beautiful little Lego house that was sitting here, uh, but that's not reality. A lot of us are living in broken, messed up homes. But I introduced this whole idea, the whole concept of kintsuki, uh, that is the Japanese art of using molten gold 
to put porcelain back together again. And we talked about how that, that's a precious metal and it makes it stronger. Those makes those, those porcelain things stronger than they ever, ever were before. And that God used his most precious thing possible to put us back together when we were broken. And that's what Jesus did, all right? So we talked about the first week. And the second week, we talked about how important it was to have a strong foundation for everything we do. And that ideally, we do that from the very beginning, that when we build something, we really focus on getting the foundation right. But even if it's not right, and even if there's cracks, and even if things have gotten messed up a little bit along the way, we talked about how important it is to come in and shore up broken and messed up foundations. Because if we don't do that, then we, and we watched the, the horrific video uh, of that condominium in Miami collapsing in a matter of like 12 seconds. And we talked about that's how our, our families can be if we don't work on the foundation. Then last week, we talked more about uh, our, our roles, our gender roles, and we, and we encourage you to have a date night, all right? And it's been really cool. I'm starting to see, I'm starting to see more and more stuff on social media about date night. But here, I got to challenge you because it's really, really kind of cool. But here's the deal. We made 400 of those white packets, all right? 400 of those white packets for, for people to take to do these date nights. That's all that's left over there on that table. It's like 20 now. So that means there's like well over 350 packets that are out there floating around. The people took and said, we're going to do date. I've seen about a dozen pictures. So some of you got to get those pictures rolling and hit social media, hashtag SCC date night or like we did date lunch or I've seen some date breakfasts, whatever, whatever, because it's important not only that we work on our marriage relationships if we are in one, but that we work on other relationships and that we encourage other people to do the same thing. Now, that's all marriage. Whew. Now we're going to pivot. We're going to shift. And we're going to spend the next three weeks talking about parenting and grandparenting and those kind of relationships with kids. And I'm going to do this week and next week, and then Jason's going to do a couple weeks from now, and we're going to talk about that. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. If you are thinking about having kids, this message is for you. If you already have little toddlers crawling around the house, this message is for you. If you've got elementary kids that are starting to feel their oats a little bit, this message is for you. If you've got teenagers, this message is really for you, all right? If you've got, ki you got kids that are leaving for college and they're away from home for the first time and you're kind of in half panic mode, this message is for you. If you've got kids that are grown, well, sort of whatever that means, then this message is for you. In other words, this is for everybody because the things we're going to talk about, the pr principles we're going to talk about are for you as a person because here's what I know. Here's what I know. Not everybody in this room may be a parent, but everybody in this room had a parent. I'm a genius. I figured that out, all right? I'm a, but, but I also know this, that in a lot of cases, that might not have been a great relationship. And so there's baggage that comes from that. So we all got to talk about this and figure out what do we do? What do we do to do the best we can and to get better? Because at the end of the day, no matter what you say, parenting is difficult, right? Parenting is difficult. They don't come with instruction man, uh, manuals at all. Jim Gaffigan said, uh, you, you know what it's like having a fourth kid? He said, imagine you're drowning and then someone hands you a baby. That's what it's like having a fourth kid. Jerry Seinfeld said that parenting is like having a, ha, you know, having a two-year-old is like having a blender and having no idea where the top is. That's like, and some of us in this room can relate to that. And so for those of you that are getting ready to have kids, think you want to have kids, you need to ask yourself this question. Are you willing to watch the same cartoon for the next four years? It, it may seem blissful, but it may get really crazy. It may get really hectic a, along the way. And, and, and I got to say this and just kind of get you ready for some stuff that's coming. If you're a parent of a two-year-old and, and like you're like, writing blogs and things about the terrible twos. Woo. <laughs> I hate to tell you, but the day's coming when they're going to put a one in front of that two, and then you're really in trouble. All right? So we got to figure this out and how we're going to navigate through all this stuff. And while we may not have had the best example of parents, we've got a great example of a good God father that loves us. And here's what every parent in the room today wants to be able to say. It's from the book of 3 John chapter 1. Look what this says. 
I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. You want that. You want, but here's, but here's what we got far too often. We got parents, we got parents that all they want to talk about is the blue ribbon their kid got at the state fair. Or the report card that for six straight report cards has been all A's. Or the trophy that their kid got for being the highest scorer in the league or for winning the league. Or that they hit the game-winning home run or the game-winning free throw or scored the game-winning touchdown. Or that they were miss whatever in this beauty thing. And I love all those things. I got no problem with you being Miss Whatever for you winning however many blue ribbons at the state fair and trophies and getting A's. But but when moms and dads are finding no greater joy than in those things instead of in that thing, we got a problem. Because the joy you want to find is knowing that your kids, trust me, the day will come when more than anything else, I just want to know that they're okay with you, God. That's all I want to know. I just want to know they're walking in the truth and they're okay with you, God. But here's the deal. Parents, listen to me. You are responsible for your part. Just your part. That's it. Just your part. Imagine this, all right? Imagine you get these circles. That's your part. You're responsible for your part. But guess what? There's more circles there, right? And not, not only are you responsible for your part, but God's responsible for his part. Guess what? He's never dropped the ball. In fact, that's the one that we're pretty, that we're guaranteed is, is going to be spot on. But then listen, and if you are a child in here, <laughs> let that sink in for a minute. If, if you are in here and you are someone's child, then you're responsible for your part. All right? And when those things come together, we got an amazing, amazing thing. But here's what happens. Here's what's happened. When your kids are little, I mean little, little, you are in control. All right? You are, if for no other reason then you outweigh them by over 100 pounds. You in that moment are in control, all right? And enjoy that moment for as long as it lasts. I know, I mean, because now we're at grandparent stage and we're just now getting out of like number four of like the, like the car carrier thing like that, you know? You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about, the one that you like undo and it's a pain to get in the back seat and undo and you're carrying it into church or to Walmart or wherever and you're talking about how horrible it is to have to carry this thing around. Trust me. I mean, the day is coming when you're going to pray they make them for teenagers. Because <laughs> for a period of time, you are in control. But there is going to be this process that takes place of switching from controller to consultant. And how you handle that, transforma- that transformative process will determine how much of a consultant role you get someday in your child's life. But the reality is everybody is their own and needs their own circle. I know some of you have been dying for this moment when I was going to undo the circle. Ain't gonna happen, all right? Just let me let you know what you're thinking ain't gonna happen, all right? It's illustrative, all right? But we all need these, all right? We want these. In fact, imagine it, because here's how they work. It's like, okay, now I am in my circle. This is my space, all right? Not the social media thing of years ago, but this is my space, all right? And, And we like, we all need that, right? We all need a space that this is me. This is me. I'm comfortable here. I feel safe here. There's a little bit of parameters. I feel good here, okay? But not only do we need a circle for us, we need other circles in our life. By God's design, by God's design, the next circle around your circle was parents. Parents. A mom and a dad that loved you. Now, reality tells us that that didn't always happen that way, right? And so there are other circles. Then the next circle sometimes is grandparents. And man, I love it. And I, I, I am one. It's the most wonderful season of life. And we got a lot of grandparents in our society, though, that are serving as what? 
parents, all right? God bless them. God bless you, all right? God bless you. But that's another circle in your child's life that they're not just, it's not a bubble, it's just a circle, all right? They, and so they need to be surrounded by parents, by grandparents, and sometimes it's not grandparents, sometimes it's aunts and uncles, so this will say extended family, okay? Let's just say that next circle is kind of extended family, all right? And then the next circle that we're all going to have are some friends, and our friends are around us, and, and that's, that for the most part, it's a good thing, but mom and dad, especially if you got little ones, let me, like, spoiler alert, the time is coming when the friend circle will have more influence potentially than the parent circle. Oh, so maybe we need to think about the friend circle and who's in that friend circle. We'll come back to that. There's another circle that's kind of around there that is like uh, teachers and coaches, all right? It's like Jason was talking about 9-11, and, and, and we remember where we were 21 years ago today, and when we saw those things. But the other, and there's another thing that I, I know you remember. Everyone in here that is past school age, I know you remember. If I say, who's your favorite teacher or coach? You don't, you're not sitting there going, gee, I don't know. No, everybody, like, Miss Wilson, second grade, I, like, she was awesome. Or, or like, you know, so-and-so that was my math teacher in high school that taught me more about life than just math. And, you know, or like coaches, like, I, I was blessed. I had great coaches all through, all the way up through college. But I remember, I remember Coach Stan was my Babe Ruth coach. And he taught me more, taught me some great stuff about pitching, made me a good pitcher, but he taught me a whole lot more about life than he did about pitching. And so, like, I remember those teachers and those coaches that had influence. And then hopefully for us, we hope there's at least one more circle that would be a difference maker circle. That would pe be people that are really making differences on a spiritual level in your kids' lives. They might be uh, the kid, the people that are working with your kids right now over in Children's Church or tonight in our student ministry. But here's why those circles are important. Did you know that, you realize, think about that, Jesus modeled that same principle. That Jesus, as while he was in his earthly form here, for the, he had his own circle. He was like, his, like, okay, here I am. But guess what he had? He had a circle of three right around him. Peter, James, and John, that were like the inner circle, that they were like, they were his guys, they were his, like, I started to say ride or die, walk or die guys. I mean, they were like, whatever, like the night that they're going to betray him, he's like, come on, we're going, I need you guys to go and pray. So he had that circle around him. And then there were nine more guys that were just outside of that, and, and the three and the nine made the twelve, the original disciples, and they were like part of Jesus's posse, they were part of his crew. And then as they did their thing, then that circle grew from 12 to 72, and then as they grew, it grew from 72 to 120, and then it grew to 5,000, and then they just stopped counting, and it was multitudes. But Jesus understood that, and each circle influenced the next circle, and they moved on that way. And so we need to, the cool thing about it is, if you think about it this way, God is kind of a circle in and of himself. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's like they, they come together. It's like, so this idea of the people around us should be easy to kind of get our minds around. But if, if circles don't work for you, think about it this way. Think about it as a boardroom. In a typical boardroom that for a, a corporation, there are eight to, tw ten, eight to 12 trustees or board members or whatever you call. And typically, the guy who runs the, the whatever the corporation is seated at the end of the table and the, like the, the chief operating officer is sitting right next to the CEO, the CEO and the CEO kind of right there together. And, and your kid is the, your kid at least thinks right now they're, they're the CEO and in this illustration they are, but you're the CEO. And and so it's kind of cool that you're right there next to each other. But look around. There's some other seats around the table, aren't they? And those seats start getting filled up. How do you want those seats filled up? They, who, are the, who are the 8 to 12 most, most influential people, loudest voices in your kid's life? But before you think too hard about that, who are the 8 to 12 loudest voices in your life? Because here's what's going on. They're watching you. And they're watching you, and who are you surrounding yourself with? And it will have a lot to do with who they surround themselves with. We've all heard the thing, it takes a village, and, 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 and that's a lot of circles in our kids' lives. But there, there's an interesting thing. This is, they've, they've studied this. That there's a lot of reality to this statement, that you will become 
the average of your five closest friends. Stay with me. What the, what the studies have shown is that you will typically, on a lot of levels, be the average of your five closest friends. The five people you hang out around the most, you add up their salaries, you divide it in half, that's going to be really close to your salary. You're going to hang out with some people and make more, some people make less. You're going to kind of be around the average. What about your marriage? How good your marriage is? Average your five closest friends. Uh, you know, all kinds of different things in life. Uh, and, and your happiness is one of those things as well. But they went on further. And sociologists, as they were studying this, they realized that there was an interesting phenomenon. Not only did those five closest friends have a huge impact in life, but each of their five closest friends. And see, the circles are expanding. And so you got you, and now you got five, and now you got, I guess, 25 more outside of that. And then they did this study and applied it directly to a couple of things. And the thing I applied it to is it's kind of like Survivor, the series. You know, in Survivor, you know, really, what's the most important thing? That you're physically strong or fast? Uh uh. That's necessary. That helps. But if you're going to win Survivor, you better be able to make alliances. The people that you get in your circle, that, that's who ends up winning Survivor. They got to be able to physically do things. But, and, and so we got people, quite frankly, some of us in here got some people we need to vote off our island. You want to see your future? Show me your friends. And they will connect very greatly. So in this series, the sociologists started, they studied two things. They studied obesity and drug use. And here's what they found. That obese friends, if you're a circle of five, are big people, that bigger than you, that there's a 45% more likely chance that you're going to gain weight. And I know I just got voted off a whole bunch of islands. <laughs> I get it. I voted, I voted myself off years ago. I, I get that. But you think about it, like, uh, well, cause why should that be? Well, because, like, when, when you're hanging out with your friends, you eat. And, that, and so it has an impact. And even then, they said there was an additional percentage of chance of that if their friends were far overweight. What about drug use? They did the same thing for drug and found out that if your five friends— use illegal drugs, there's a 61% higher chance that you will. And if the friends at their neck circle, then of what's left of the original 39% that you had left, chance you had left, that then 29% of it, you know, was gone. And then if the friends at that neck circle did, you had no chance. Because then everybody for two generations, two cycles around you was in the madness. You're probably going to be in the madness. Then this one fascinated me. They did it for happiness. They did it for happiness. And so they started checking out. And here's what they found. They, they, they did the first cycle, the five. And they said, what about the next? And they found this, that if the people in that second generation, the, the five friends or your five friends, if they tended to be really, really happy in life, that, that there was a 6% chance you were going to get happier. And I know a lot of people are like, 6%. <laughs> That's a nickel and a penny. So who cares? So who cares about that? But listen to this. They asked the same people, if you got a $10,000 raise tomorrow at work, your salary just went up $10,000 overnight, they found that it raised the happiness quotient by 2%. You with me? So, friend, having friends that are happy had a three times greater chance of affecting your happiness than a $10,000 raise did. Who are in your circles? Who are you surrounding? Who are in your kids' circles? Here's what Proverbs 13 says. We've got to hurry through this. It says, walk with the wise and you become what? Wise. And it says, for a companion of fools suffers what? Harm. All right. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. Here, here's how that played out. Remember I told you, you know, that consultant and controller thing? Look at these circles, all right? Here's how that plays out with that. See, the, the numbers that are on here like are ages, okay? So, like your, ki your children are zero to six. You are in control. The blue is the control. And the orange is the consultant. So, you are, in fact, the orange is probably too big there in that. But you are, you are dominantly in control, zero to six. And then they start school. So I put 6 to 16. Well, you're still in control. You're paying the bills. You're buying the clothes. You're buying the food. You're, you're still in control, but not as much as when they were 0 to 6. 
And then I, some of the things that I thought about would have put like 18 when they become adult. But trust me, at 16, they start driving. They start going out. You have now moved into consultant role more than control role. They've got freedom. And then they get 25, 30, whatever, and they're out there on their own. You have virtually zero control, but hopefully a lot of influence and consultant role. But how you handle those various transitions will determine what kind of level of control you have when this thing gets all the way to the end. Because what we want to do is keep working that so that we can be a consultant because a better circle provides better experience. And the quality of your circle around you increases the quality of your child's circles, their life, their choices, and their direction. Solomon's the wisest man who ever lived. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, here's what he wrote. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, the other one can help them up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three stands is not quickly broken. Uh, one can fight, but two can defend themselves. Have you ever seen a movie or maybe... <laughs> Maybe you experienced it. Hopefully you didn't experience it. But like, if you see on the streets and fighting and there's a couple guys that get jumped by 10 or 12 guys and they have any experience at all, the very first thing those two guys are going to do is get back to back. That's where we get the phrase, I got your back. All right? Because if we're back to back, now we can see everything. But if we're standing next to each other, we can't see anything that's going on behind us. So if, I've got, if I'm trying to battle 10 people, and trust all of us are trying to battle 10 things. So we need some people that are back to back with us that can help us out. But then you put a third one in there, now we really got eyes on every situation. And a quarter of three strands is not easily broken. See, here's, here's the reality. Your child is going to fall down and scrape their knee. It's going to happen. You can put elbow pads and knee pads. You can put them in a bubble. They are going to fall down and get hurt. And the older they get, the falls are harder and they get hurt more. All right? That, that, that's just how it happens. But hopefully there's going to be people that can help pick them back up. And how we treat those seats at the board table. And they start inviting friends to sit at the seats in their board table. You may not like that friend. But you better be careful how you treat that friend. Because if you just got like get go off on that friend, guess what? That's when you get moved from the seat next to the CEO to the seat at the other end of the table and eventually out of the room. And so you better know how to navigate. Now, you still have influence. And so if, if they bring somebody into the boardroom, doesn't need to be in the boardroom, you got to talk about it. But you better be smart in how you talk about it and how you handle it. And because you always want a seat at the table. Paul said, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he said, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. That's, your kids get some idle and disruptive friends in their life, and it's going to cause trouble. So warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened, but be nice to them. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. And make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. But always strive to do what is right and good uh, for each other and for everyone else. See, here, listen to me. As your child ages, they're going to start filling in those seats at the table, even if you do everything right. And you're not going to do everything right. None of us did, none of us will. So we got to make sure that we do the best we can to keep those, those communication lines open. How many of you have experienced, I'm, maybe I'm the only one. Is there any, any other parents in here that have told your kids something like a gazillion times? That's like slightly over eight, okay? Like you, you've told them over and over and over. And then someone else, you know where I'm going. Someone else tells them the exact same thing that you've been telling them. And suddenly that person's up for a Nobel Prize. And you're like, what? What if, what if you think of it this way, though? What if instead of being frustrated that they didn't hear it from you, what if you're just thankful they heard it from someone? 
What if they had let someone else into their circle and around their table that at least was saying the same thing you wanted said, you just don't get credit for it? Doesn't that sound like a win to you? It sounds like a good situation. So that's why, that's why here, I'm going to finish this up and we're almost done. That's why we want to partner with you as a church. And listen, I'm, I'm going to be as gentle as I can be right here for the next five minutes and we're done, okay? We want to partner with you. We don't want to raise your children. Ain't our job. You chose to have them. You need to raise them. You need to raise them in the Lord. But we want to come alongside and partner and help out to the best level we can. That's why we spend so much money, so much time on, on children's ministry, all the way from cradle to college. That we, that's why we've got five staff people that work from cradle to college overseeing all of our ministries for, for little kids and students and overseeing all that stuff. It's an important deal to us. It's an important deal to us. And, and, and we need difference makers. Like right now, we've got some awesome, awesome, awesome. I've been hanging out around the stew some on Sunday nights. Our student ministry for middle school starts at 5 o'clock on Sunday night and for high school and next phase at 7 o'clock. And there's some incredible adults, but we need a few more difference makers. We need a few more people that have got enough years of experience under their belt that they can come alongside of those kids in a small group setting and be a difference maker and speak truth in their life. To be that person that is saying the same thing their mom and dad was saying, but they're just not their mom and dad. We need you guys. So if you want to be a difference maker in that way, come see me afterwards. I will hook you up with Ray and Victoria and we'll roll with that. This, this Tuesday. In fact, Tuesday and Thursday, we do a thing called Rise Up, which is a ministry to moms who have little dinky dudes that are pulling their hair out, all right, and going crazy. And so once a month, we do this program on Tuesday morning and on Thursday night, first week of the month, where those mothers of those kids can get together and just hang out. Guess what? When they get together just to hang out and encourage one another, they don't need Johnny and Susie with them. That means we need some difference makers to come and be here for a couple hours once a month and take care of some kids. If you want to do that, come see me. I can hook you up with the right people. I just so happen to have raised one of the ones that's in charge of that. So I can hook you up with her, all right? Uh, but, but now let me be your pastor for a moment. All right? Thursday night, Larry Baker was sitting over here. I just happened to look over, and he was sitting about where Sam is right now. And he was like, had his hand just down. I said, yeah, you need to hold on right now. And I told everybody else, maybe you need to put everything else down and just grab the side of your seat and hold on for a minute and know that I love you, but here we go. If you are a parent who still has children at home, they need to be here in our children's and youth ministry whenever it happens. All right? Whenever it happens. Whenever it happens. And, and, and it, it, I, I have parents tell me, I, I just want my kids to make their own choice about church and if they're going to go or not. What? <laughs> when that big yellow vehicle stops in front of your house tomorrow, you going to let them choose if they're getting on it or not? No! You're surrendering control to a seven-year-old. And they're saying, oh, I don't have any fun. You're getting played. You're getting played. You know what I mean? And, and teenagers, teenage, I have parents going, oh, we just got to figure out something to do because my, my kid, my, my middle school, my high school kid, they just can't handle big church. What? Really? And I hear sometimes like people, their kid's 16. Like, they can't handle big church. You gave them the keys to the family car, but they can't handle church? Or at a far earlier age, you gave them one of these? And you gave them keys to the World Wide Web, but they can't handle church? Come on, you're getting played. And here's what you need to know. It's not going to be long that they're coming after your debit card because they got you. They got you. Now, listen, I, you thought you'll never hear this in a church. If you say that my kids just aren't getting anything out of this church, okay, go find one. We release you. We release you. I don't think you're going to find it around here close, but if you find a better place that can minister to your kids better than what our staff can do down there, have at it. Go. Because it's that important. It's that important. All right? 
But if you say, no, this is the place, this needs to be the place, and they need to, don't let them play you, because the day's going to come when the, you got, you're out of control. Don't surrender. We do not negotiate with terrorists. Some of you are raising seven-year-old terrorists. All right? All right? Oh, but they're so cute. I know they're cute. That's what makes them dangerous. You're getting played. Because God said, it's your job. Moms, dads, it's your job. And praise God for grandparents and aunts and uncles that are stepping in and filling in some voids along the way. But we've got to do this together. Our circles are important. I'm not saying, uh, they're going to have fun here. They're going to have, and one of the reasons they may not want to come to church or to school or whatever, is they may have had one of the people like this in their life. They may have had somebody like this in their life that when they screwed up, they told them they screwed up. And they can't handle it. And so rather than dealing with it, they want to avoid it. Guess who taught them that? I told you, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> They're watching. They're watching. Um, mom and dad aren't getting along, so they just avoid each other. That's how we do. When, when things don't go your way, you just avoid each other. Dad doesn't like his boss at work, so he's just quit and found another job. That's what you do when things don't go right in life. You just avoid each other. They're learning. Who are they learning from? Who are they learning from? See, we all need circles. We need good circles, but they need to be a circle of balance, and, uh, a balance of truth and grace. You know, you know, man, you messed up, but come on, let's get it right. Man, you, you, did, you, did, it, you did it awesome. Here, you can do it better. And we just balance truth and grace along the way because Proverbs says iron sharpens iron and one person sharpens another person. We carry each other's burdens. That's what the Bible says, that we love each other even when it's difficult, that we carry each other's burdens and fulfill the But we push people forward. We've got to push people forward. Proverbs 19 says, listen to advice and accept discipline. And at the end, you will be counted as wise. Don't delay this effort for spiritual maturity. Hey, I'll be honest, our kid, your kids are going to have fun here. Because we do some crazy, stupid, fun stuff here. But they're going to get pushed. They're going to get pushed and, 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 and they're going to be challenged because they need that. See these circles. You ever seen a magician use one of these? You know what magicians do with these? They sew curtains on them. And then they, they, they do this, and they step inside of it, and then they raise it up. And when they get it to here, what happened to the magician? They just disappeared. Our kids are doing that. They're coming home, and they're going upstairs to their room, and they're, they're putting the curtain up. They're, they're, and and maybe, it's because, maybe it's because they need their space because in the past they didn't have their space, and they got hurt really bad. And so they need their space and they need their walls. But when we start building walls, curtains, whatever, that have no doors and no windows, we're isolating and that is a recipe for disaster. Because right? what happens? What happens? The magician puts the curtains around the hula hoop and puts it up and now we can't see him or her. We don't know what they're doing. And then suddenly we throw a fit and we want to tear the curtain down, and it's just like the magician, they're gone. They're gone. It's over. We lost that moment. We lost that time in their life. And because our kids need their circles, but they need to be interconnected. They need to be interconnected. You know, here's, you know what that looks like? I was born in Tennessee. I lived in Johnson City, Tennessee, for exactly 364 days. The day before my first birthday, God saw fit to grace us and bring our family back home to Kentucky. Praise God. I am a Kentucky boy through and through for the last 60 years of my life. From my grandparents in the mountains of eastern Kentucky to the Ohio River to West, I'm a Kentucky boy through and through. But you know what? Kentucky here. Tennessee's here. I kind of like some things in Tennessee. I like that I-75 and I-65 exist. Because I like going to the Smokies, and I like going to Nashville, and I like knowing that although I'm, a, I'm here in my bubble, that I can get out of my bubble and be interconnected to another bubble. And then if I get really crazy, I can actually go north. I don't know why, but I, I can go north and do that too. You know, I like that. And you know what? Our states, although they're separate, 
they are interconnected by interstate. And our kids are separate, but they need to be interconnected. We just need to make sure they're connected to the right people in their life. Our children need to be their own individuals, but they need to be interconnected through proper circles. And, and, and we're done. We're done. This has been an awesome day. But look, listen. I hate preaching these sermons. <laughs> this whole series. Because every Tuesday when I sit down at my computer, I'm reminded of how many times I've messed up as a husband and as a dad. But I still got to keep working. I still got to keep working. And I've learned some things over the years. I'm 61. But I think I'd be a pretty good parent to a preschooler right now. I said that Thursday night and Kim fainted on the front row. <laughs> But the biggest lesson that I've learned is we all need Jesus. We all need Jesus. And the best connection, the best circle connection that you can ever give to your kids is to get them connected to Jesus. But you can't make that connection for them unless you do what these ladies did this morning and you get connected yourself. Because when you get connected yourself, you're like a giant Lego block that now can start connecting other people to the supplication that along the way they might depart for a little while. <laughs> it's called adolescence, all right? They might go through that for a little while. But if you train them up in the way they should go when they're old, they won't depart from it. Listen to me very carefully. You can't go back to where you've never been. Chew on that today. You, you can't go back to where you've never been. And some of you are here today as healthy, vibrant adults who have a past, who have some ugly back there. But at some point in time when you were little and you were rebellious, somebody introduced you to this man named Jesus. And when you finally woke up like the prodigal son and came to your senses, you came running back to a place that you had been before. And you found hope and restoration and redemption and your broken house got put back together again. That won't happen if you don't know Jesus. So I want to ask you to stand right now. If you had two more, I don't have anything to do this afternoon until five o'clock. I'm good for the next several hours. So if you want to talk about what it means, I, I'm not that interested in talking about football, although it was a good football weekend in Kentucky. Amen, amen, amen. Both schools, amen, amen. Um, but if you want to talk about Jesus, I can stay here all day. All day. My afternoon's committed to anybody who wants to talk about Jesus. Other stuff's going on. I don't want to talk about that today. I don't want to talk about that today. I want to talk about Jesus and you needing to get connected to Jesus. So while we sing, if you need to make that move, Jan's over here, Jason's back here. We got other people in the room. We got elders in the room. Come on. Come on. What in the world are you waiting for? Why not get connected to the one who can make all the difference in your life? Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch, my heart can't help but believe.
man, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. And if this is your first time ever worshiping, man, you picked a cool day to be here. We've got a gift for you out at the I'm New Wall or out at the tents on the way out. If you, if you don't mind, stop by there. We'd love to get to meet you and let you know about some things. We've got several things that are going on this month. Don't forget what today is. Don't forget and be thankful for people. Be thankful for men and women that serve our country, either locally as— for, Yes, absolutely. As, as first responders— uh, here locally, be thankful for them. Say a kind word to them when you see them. For our men and women in the military and some that are just now going off to training and stuff, lift them up in prayer uh, that God speak and keep them safe because they're doing that uh, because of what they love and because of, of who we are as a country. So pray for them. Uh, that thing I talked about for moms of preschool kids is Tuesday morning, Thursday night this week. Uh, Friday, ladies, is the day we've been getting ready for. John to Pierce, 7 o'clock right here in this room. Tickets are gone. Hopefully you got one. Hopefully you got one. Uh, but guys, listen to me. I need about four of you that can be here Friday morning around 9 o'clock to help unload the buses of the merchandise that they'll have for sale here. And I need about four that can come back about 10 o'clock Friday night and help reload the truck. Uh, it only take a couple, an hour to two hours each time. So if you can help either of those times, come see me. That would be really, really helpful. And it's going to be an awesome night, uh, 7 o'clock right here. And then the following weekend, uh, the following weekend on the 24th, on Saturday night, the 24th, we've been talking about marriage and family. We've got a special marriage date night uh, on the 24th. And you can sign up for that back at the table right back there. Bobby will be back there, can answer questions. And that'll be a fun, fun, fun fun night uh, for anybody who wants to come back. Thanks for being here. It's been an awesome day. Let's get out of here. Go love God, love people. Let's go change the world. See you guys.